Welcome to the Holy Smokes Podcast, a show about faith, friendship, fine tobacco and drink. I am Steve Ryder in the lion's den with one of my favorites that I just don't get to spend enough time with, Mark Humphreys. Mark, thanks for being on the show, my man. Steve, thanks for having me. This is, uh, I've been to this place outside a few times when you guys have had big Holy Smoke gatherings, but I've never actually been in the lion's den. I get it now. Leather, <laughs> lions, and cigars. This is a very good thing. Really good conversations happen. Last night I was here with Kay and Grayson and a few other guys. Derek Fulmer, the owner of Lion's Den, and Matt Hurd, who's been a guest on the show. And uh, it was just, the conversations were fun. Just telling stories and digging in and hearing about what's going on in everyone's lives. Yeah, Wonderful. special stuff happens here. Great. And really good conversations on the podcast happen here, too. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. So, first question I ask, what you're smoking? This was just gifted to me by you. And this would be a safari. You'd probably safari have to cigars. Like safari cigar. Yep. Joe Basil and his father-in-law, Doug Giles. There it's, you have it's, it. It's a favorite of people that are on the podcast. What are, what are your first thoughts? Well, for starters, I feel like I've got to dislocate my jaw to get my mouth around it. Because I've never spoke. <laughs> it's, spoke a big, it's, it's a big it's a cigar. big box press. It's a yes. very big box press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And surprised because I thought it would be, uh, you know, I like kind of medium cigars. Yeah. I thought this might be bolder than it is. I like it. I would say this is between medium and bold. Did you say this is a Maduro? Yep. I'm not a cigar expert, but I like kind of medium bodied cigars. Yeah. This is working. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you like it. I'm looking forward to getting some more from you, Joe. <clears throat> <laughs> so, Mark, where'd you grow up? Southern California, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, primarily. I, uh, when people say where is home, I still say San Diego. Uh, just a little bit of my backstory. I was actually born in the L.A. area. Okay. And uh, my father was a pastor there. Started a, a church in Granada Hills in the San yeah. Fernando Valley. Yeah. And then uh, he took a pastor in a church in Oregon. But when I was nine, we moved to San Diego. So I, I still think of San Diego kind of as, as home. I think you upgraded. <laughs> and all my time in out there in Southern California, I've really fallen in love with San Diego County. There's worse places to live. I mean, you and I were talking beforehand that the six month anniversary of Elizabeth's passing, mm. I went out last year, I went out to uh, Oceanside, got a place right on the ocean, showed you a little video of the view from my balcony. And then uh, I was out there in June and uh, decided I wanted to go spend a little bit more time down there and take the boys down to a beach down there. And so... We were thinking about Carlsbad, but something inside of me just said, go to Del Mar. And oh my goodness, <laughs> those bluffs there in Del Mar, yeah. just walking the beach with them. It was so good for my soul. And them too. They, they love it out there. Yeah. You're making me envious. But not enough to move. Yeah. Well, there's something we were talking before. There's something as far as I'm concerned that the ocean has healing properties. Yes. I believe that. Just salt water, the, the ozone, the... Just the fluidity, the, the life in it. Now, before we started talking, you mentioned that, you know, the mountains are great, but they're static. The ocean is alive and moving and all of that. Do you do a lot of hiking? Do you hike? I really don't. Oh, dude, you got to get up into the mountains near a mountain stream and just sit by a mountain mm. stream for a while. That's just going right by you. Because for me, that's a good second best. Okay. Like, I love the mountains. I mean, just last weekend, I did a backpacking trip, two nights, 26 miles, 5,300 foot total elevation gain between the three days. It was a tough hike, but it was really, really good. And uh, um, just sitting by a, a mountain lake, an alpine lake, sitting yes. by, you know, a mountain stream, I've found that to be just about as good as the ocean. Okay. It's a nice close second. second All right, best. I feel like it's a bit of a reach, Steve. But <laughs> <laughs> it is water. You're right. It is water. Maybe not quite as dynamic as the Pacific Ocean. No, no, not, not yeah, even yeah, yeah. close. Not exactly. even close. But I found that you know just the quiet, and I'm surrounded with beauty mm -hmm. with the mountains that I'm not really surrounded with to as much of an extent. I mean, yeah, Good there point. are there are places where the mountains do go right up against you know 
Yeah. Where, where you do have scenery in the back in, in California, you know, the opposite way from the ocean. And Hawaii is absolutely amazing. Yeah. But you, you, you get these granite topped Rocky Mountains mm -hmm. and you're up above tree line in this freezing cold Alpine Lake mm -hmm. doing some Wim Hof ice bath. <laughs> And it's, no, just, thank it's you. so good. It's so good yeah. for your soul. It's so good for my soul. So you moved to San Diego. Moved to San Diego. I guess just to back up a little bit, one of the things that I found helpful, and I so appreciate this opportunity. I'm a, I'm a, a therapist. I'm a marriage yes. and family therapist. And I have Which is one, one of the other reasons I wanted to have you on. Okay. Yeah. I've regularly encouraged people to take their story seriously. From a therapeutic standpoint, there can be a lot of good things happen when people do reconstructive therapy. So this was my invitation. Now, what's reconstructive therapy? Basically, it's, it would be reintegrating or re-putting together one story and kind of understanding uh, okay. who we are based upon who we've been mm. and trying as best we can. By nature, we're subjective beings, but really trying as best we can objectively to understand you know, you can build some pretty cool stuff on the fourth story of a building, but by definition, that has to be built on the third and the second and the first and then the foundation. So it can be really helpful to mm. kind of reconstruct one's past and, and try to understand again, you know, why we are who we are. Yeah. But I'm thankful. I'm, Elaine and I just turned 67 a couple of weeks ago. And that well, still happy kinda, belated birthday. Thank you. Kind of takes my breath away to say that. I, uh, I'm increasingly looking at life as a football game. And with four quarters, if we go to 80, uh, I did the math and I'm well into the fourth quarter. Kind of funny, I was with a buddy not too long ago and I told him, uh, I told him that. And he's a good bit older than me. He said, Mark, if you're in the fourth quarter, I think I just heard a two minute warning. <laughs> not even close, bro, not even close. We'll talk about Dr. David Sinclair's book, Health Span. Dr. David Sinclair is a, is a Harvard researcher. I'm actually just listening to it for like, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time. It was one of my top books in 2019. He's a Harvard researcher, and what they're doing is they're attacking aging and trying to slow it down, maybe even reverse it. And they really think that they're, they are seeing massive breakthroughs when it comes to that in terms of regenerating optic nerves and rege cell regeneration and making mice lives significantly longer and, and and it's all with the goal of increasing health span then lifespan and so that way you're healthier longer and dude you look great for 67 you you work out right you look like you do i i try you, you try you look like you stay in shape you definitely stay in shape but well i i uh I, I tell people it may be old meat but it's tough meat i'm i'm a competitive handball player there you and go. Uh, that keeps me going these days i just love that game and so yep it's fun to get on the handball court. Nice. So, well, you can live a lot longer than 80, bro. Trust me. Okay. You can live a lot longer than 80 with the stuff that's coming. Good news. Yep. So, um, yeah, this was a challenge. It was a challenge kind of putting one's life together at uh, 67, a lot of water under the bridge, but I, I kind of broke it down into three parts that at least helps me get my, yeah. uh, my hands around it. And so, um, I think I mentioned my dad was a pastor and um, just to give you a little bit about, you know, my, the backdrop of my story as a kid, my dad was a Baptist pastor and loved his heart. My dad was um, not only loved God, but he loved truth. Mm. My dad, I would say, was just a heat seeking missile for the truth, all truth, and was very grateful to be brought up in a home where um, he was so intentional about uh, the things of God. And my mom was the dutiful pastor's wife, Baptist pastor's wife, played the piano, uh, juggled balls, spin plates, and rode a unicycle all at the same time. So it's just very grateful for that background and, and, um, and their intentionality in raising us in the admonition of the Lord. Now, when I hear pastor's kid, I often, because I worked at Focus on the Family for 12 and a half years. And one of my responsibilities for a lot of those years was the tape series, pastor to pastor mm -hmm. started as a tape series, then became a CD series. And then eventually focus ended up stopping their pastoral ministries division and stopping pastor to pastor. Mm -hmm. But 
I would hear stories of pastor's kids, and, and there were really two main categories when it came to pastor's kids. The kids that looked back at it very fondly because the parents really protected them from a lot of the church negativity, the church politics, the church expectations, all of that stuff. And then the other ones that weren't protected and they hated it. Or they just came out with a lot of wounding. Mm -hmm. and, and the kids that hated it often would leave the faith or just have a great deal of resentment towards the church or just come out of it with wounding but still love Jesus. Mm -hmm. where, where were you on that spectrum? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say uh, some of both. Um, like I said, I was so grateful to be born into a home where there was a power source for light and hope and truth and forgiveness and mercy and all those wonderful things. And my dad was a Baptist pastor. And uh, I remember the church he, uh, he pastored in Eugene, Oregon was called Berean Baptist Church, you know, students of the word. And so I was very grateful for the intentionality and yet at the same time, intentionality to know the word of God. And yet at the same time, it seemed like more and more, when I, I came to Christ at seven. There's kind of a cool story around yeah. that. I'll tell it. So we're living in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, was uh, in a Sunday school class. You're probably too young to remember. Do you remember flannel graphs or do you even know what a flannel oh, graph yeah, is? I remember flannel graphs. You do? I'm 47. Okay. All right. I'm, I remember. So I'm in the Sunday school class. Yeah. And a little, dear little old lady Sunday school teacher is teaching a lesson on salvation, on, on Christ's recon mission to planet Earth to rescue us. And all I can remember, Steve, was there was a heart-shaped black felt piece that she put on the flannel board. And she's talking about my sin. And she talks about Jesus' love in coming to planet Earth to rescue me and mankind, she put a red heart over that black heart, and it became a white heart. I remember that one. Do you? Oh, yeah. I remember. Well, for me, I don't know what kind of stinker I could have been at, at seven, but I immediately resonated with the black heart. The message of Christ loving me yeah. immediately resonated, and I wanted that white heart, so I went home and, and uh, accepted Christ. Kind of a funny, quirky part of that is a week later, at the end of our block, I was convinced there was a, a, a witch that lived in a home, uh, a little beat up, kind of a, I say a home, it was kind of a shack at the end of the block. And a buddy and I one time, I don't know what we were doing, we peered in the window and she had a cross on the, yeah. on the wall. And we're like, witches shouldn't have crosses in their home. We broke into that house stole the cross, we were on a mission from God. I bring it back to my Sunday school teacher the next Sunday, and she's mortified. Where did you get this? What is this about everything? So that was an interesting conversation where she brought my pastor father in, and I had to explain to her our, that was a mission from God, that we, we were just convinced we needed to steal that cross. And what was the punishment? Going back to the witch, confessing our sins, asking for forgiveness. <laughs> anyway, but that's when, that's when I came to Christ at the age of seven. Mm. But I'd say the rest of that story, to answer your question about the pros and cons, is what I found was in my young teenage years, I fell in love with Christ because of the truth and the freedom. You know the truth, the truth will set you free. And more and more, as I was kind of looking for how to live the Christian life, I was getting messages either overtly or covertly of just say no, do the right thing. After all that Jesus did for you, you just do the right thing for him. And I just uh, inherently knew there was a larger story than that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of my pet peeves is just say no doesn't work. It shouldn't work. It didn't work for me. I think for healthy teenagers, it typically doesn't work. We need to invite kids into a story that they can say yes to with all their hearts. And so for me, my adolescence was in large part, it was a story of I love Jesus. He was my only hope. Mm -hmm. And yet the kids I was hanging around with in large part were Christians. They were just normal mm -hmm. kids. I'd kind of do the best I could, but I was a normal experiential kid. 
So I never overtly denied Christ, but I just found the invitation to just say no or just to do the right thing without more meaning to it to be something that was unsustainable for me. Mm, I can identify with that. Yeah. So, you know, and then I, of course, as a PK, I would go to church camp and become convicted of my... Repent. (laughs) Exactly. I think I was saved nine times. (laughs) (laughs) At least for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it really was a story of loving Christ, but until um, really getting some invitations to walk into the fullness of the invitation of of really partnering with Christ and understanding all he designed me to be, that's when my Christian life came alive. Mm. When did that happen? So that really happened at the age of 25. All right. Um, Yeah, just to back up a little bit from that, We'll get back to that. Okay. We'll get back to that. We can pick back up on that. We'll we'll get back to that. A big part of my life was uh, athletics. And when we moved, let's see, I I think it was in the middle of third grade. I was nine years old. What sports did you play? Played football primarily. What position? Defensive end. Ooh, I knew I liked you. Ooh, (laughs) I knew I liked you. That was my favorite. Yeah? Yeah, that was my favorite. More fun to be the hitter than the hitty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. So, yeah, I'll never forget, middle of third grade, that's a bad deal to move a kid in the middle of a grade. Yeah. So we moved from Eugene, Oregon to San Diego and didn't know anybody. And so fortunately, my dad got me into Little League. Mm-hmm. What, I wasn't much of a baseball player, but that kind of started athletics. Yeah. And then I was always a physical kid. I just always, in fact, I remember before we moved to San Diego, I was the kid that we had loudspeakers and there was a loudspeaker from the office saying, would Mark Humphreys please come into the office? And I think this is the third or fourth time that they called me in. And I was always wrestling kids on the playground. And I wasn't a mean-spirited kid or a bully or anything. I just loved physical contact. Yeah. And the principal, I'll never forget this, talking about some of the downsides of PK. I promise this is true. She says, Mark, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, you got to stop wrestling on the playground. Your dad's a pastor. And I'm like... In my mind, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. let me be a kid. Do you have any siblings? Two siblings. What yep. number were you in the order? I'm the oldest. I was supposed to be the example. Yeah. I get it. I'm the same. <laughs> You're the same way. Yeah. Oldest yeah. of three. Oldest of three. Okay. Three boys. You? Okay. A uh, brother and a sister. Okay. Yeah. So. Sister's the baby? Sister's the baby. Ooh, two big brothers protecting baby sister. <laughs> Especially a big guy like you. Yeah. Did you ever intimidate any of her boyfriends? Oh, let's see. No, I can't remember intimidating. Put the fear of God into them? Uh, no, I, I can't oh. remember doing that. <laughs> so sports became kind of my proving ground. Yeah. In that environment, it was kind of the only kind of game in town, so to speak. So... I was kind of an undersized uh, kid, a sophomore in high school, 150 pounds, and barely made the JV team. I had to uh, literally, what I think we had 60 kids on that team, and we only had 40 jerseys or something. So yeah. a Thursday practices before Friday games, the coach would literally throw out you know, some jerseys and the uh, scrubs had to fight for the jerseys so we could stand on the sideline the next day with it with a jersey. Yeah. So at any rate, I just kind of kept working at it. I wouldn't say I've got a lot of natural skill and ability, but I just I had a vision to become better and better and kind of a late bloomer. I had to play JV football as a junior, which was kind of humiliating as most of the kids as juniors were playing uh, varsity football. So, but it was a good thing for me because that meant I played a lot. Mm -hmm. And then my senior year, I had gained another 25 pounds, about 200 pounds, and and, um, did well my senior year. Wasn't good enough to play college, four-year college football from there. So I went to two years at junior college, San Diego Mesa, and really came into my own, did well. Really? And then, uh, yeah, I got a couple offers. I had an offer from the University of Oregon. Wow. And then from Boise State, which is where I went. Yeah. So it was either at that point, either lose in the pack eight or win in the big sky. So 
I guess getting back to my, my spiritual journey, I uh, remember when I went to Boise, I was so grateful to be able to get that scholarship and to play at that level. And the one thing I wanted to do is I didn't want to be just another dumb jock that majored in PE. So I remember my junior year, uh, I had to declare a major and I knew I didn't want it to be PE. So, uh, you know, I'm not a math guy. I'm not a history guy. I'm not a business guy. And so kind of by process of elimination, I majored in psychology. I had a few interesting psych classes. Yeah. And um, so that was kind of uh, a blessing in disguise, I, mm -hmm. I suppose. So after graduating from Boise, I, uh, what do you do with a BA in psych? Uh, so I ended up going back to San Diego, ended up coaching high school football for a coach I played for in, in high school for a couple years. And pretty quickly discovered I didn't want the rest of my life to be football and X's and O's. And I'd kind of been there, done that. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I was in the right place in the right time, found out about a master's degree program in counseling that fascinated me. It was uh, the first year at San Diego State. It was a program called the Community Based Block Program. And a fellow named Dave Malcolm, who I don't know if you know who Carl Rogers was. He was a. Uh, father of uh, humanistic psychology. Okay. Anyway, he was a right-hand man to Carl Rogers in the old days, and brilliant guy. Started a program that he wanted to be based surely experientially on the students learning from each other. And so there was a group, I think, of about 30 of us, and we were specifically chosen for our diversity. I was like the token white male. I mean, you can hardly imagine the diversity. This is back shoot, I don't know, 40 years ago, we had an Indian Indian, a guy whose dad was American Indian, his mom was Asian Indian. We had uh, a black Muslim who converted from Christianity to Islam. Mm -hmm. We had a topless dancer. <laughs> we had uh, quite a spot. We had hardcore uh, Chicanos. Yeah. Uh, of course, being in San Diego, you know, big Hispanic influence. And... Um, the whole premise was we were going to kind of wade into, again, why we are who we are uh, and try to learn from each other. So experientially, that kind of whetted my appetite for the difference and the distinctiveness of people. How old were you when you went through that program? So let's see, I would have been 23. What did it do yeah. for you? How did it shape you? How did it, was that like a turning point in your life at all? You know, I don't know if it was a turning point. What it made me realize is that Christ really was my only hope. Huh. How so? Well, I think a lot of my colleagues there were doing the best they could. But when push comes to shove, there wasn't uh, really a true north. There didn't seem to be um, really a power source for forgiveness or for inherent meaning. Mm -hmm. It was once again, you know, religion, I think is man's attempt to reach God. And yeah. it was just a reminder to me of how vibrant Christianity is because mm -hmm. Jesus did for me what I could never do for myself. Mm -hmm. So you made it through that program. Went through that program and then was very fortunate to get a job as a district counselor in San Diego City School District. Did that for about five years. But I quickly discovered that that really wasn't counseling. It was more kind of a quasi-administrative thing. Teachers, principals throwing kids in my office, instructing me to fix them or move them or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, obviously to do therapy, the, the, uh, there has one to of the things that you buy need. buy-in, not by the kid. Well, exactly. You, you just need a motivated client. And, and a kid getting thrown into your office, there's no buy-in. No, no. So I was grateful for that job, but it really whetted my appetite to go on and really become a counselor. Yeah. So at that point, then I got into a doctoral program for on weekends and nights because I had to continue working. So I was in a doctoral program for four years to be able to become licensed. Mm. So that was kind of the start of my professional career then. Nice. Where'd you go after that? So I uh, started counseling in, in North County San Diego, there's a town called Escondido, and was very fortunate, got into practice with a couple women. Uh, Escondido Counseling Ministries was there for about eight years, and that was kind of the, 
the, the center of uh, our raising our young family. And, and I leapfrog right over yeah. my family. Can I talk about them a little bit? Well, yes. And then I'll jump was, back I, in. I would have asked. Okay, very good. So, uh, wife Elaine, we've been married 40 years. Congratulations. We, we think it's going to work. <laughs> when she threatens otherwise, I remind her I've got 250 witnesses that saw her say forever and ever, amen. So, no back door, Elaine. we got three wonderful kids, adult kids. We've got five. How old and, are they? And boy, girls. Yes. Okay. So, the two boys are, are uh, 37, 35. Okay. Both firemen. Really? For whatever reason. I say really? whatever reason. My brother was a, was a fire captain in San Diego. Okay. So I'm sure that's part of the reason. Oh, yeah. And uh, we've got our oldest son lives in Breckenridge. Three wonderful grandchildren. Our middle son is single living in San Diego. And then our daughter, Michelle, who's really my hero. Really? She, uh, her name is Michelle. I intentionally, we intentionally named her Michelle. For starters, I just love that beautiful French name. Plus, I love the Beatles. Michelle, my bell. Yeah. Love that song. Tortured her with that many times. And then she changes. She goes by Shelly in high school. I'm like, Shelly? It's supposed to be Michelle. Anyway, that's Shelly now. Shelly uh, is a registered nurse, and she moved to Bolivia 11 years ago to be a missionary in a hospital. Mm. And I uh, married a Bolivian man, wonderful Bolivian man. They started a children's home called Tolita Kumi, which is Aramaic for little child to rise. Hmm. And Shelly is not afraid. She just started this thing. And the stories about those 20 children would curl your hair. I mean, they're not all orphans. Some of them have parents, but some of them were, as infants, were pulled out of dumpsters, wow. et cetera, et cetera. It goes wow. on and on and on. Wow. At any rate, she's back now. They just moved back here two months ago. She's becoming a nurse practitioner, and she's still running Toledo Kumi. They're still running Toledo Kumi long distance. Nice. So, and she's got two of our grandchildren, and next month in two weeks, she's due with her third. Congratulations. So, we're wealthy, wealthy parents with almost six grandchildren. So. Nice. So. How'd you meet your wife? We met at a Christian singles group in a Baptist church. Yeah. So two lonely hearts at sea. And I had just come back to Christ at the age of 25. And what I knew that I knew that I knew is that I wanted a woman that loved Jesus way more than me. Mm -hmm. And in this singles group, it was just clear that Elaine was someone who was so sold out to Jesus and wanted to become all she could be in the light of her Lord and Savior. And so that was money to me. It's like I knew enough about marriage to know it's hard, to know it's challenging. And we jokingly like to startle Christians that don't know us very well by telling them that we're both involved with another man. <laughs> After they're a little mortified and their jaw drops a little bit. <laughs> of course, we inform yeah. that his name is Jesus and it wasn't for him. Yeah. It'd be a, a whole lot harder road to hoe. Yeah. So. so you're raising a family in Escondido. You're there eight years. Yes. And we had always been focused on the family supporters. Mm -hmm. In my practice, I got a number of referrals from Focus. And we got an opportunity to interview for a job. I focused on the family in 1994. And our other motivation to explore that was we didn't want to raise our kids in Southern California. As much as I loved it, it was getting kind of fast and furious. And we wanted to kind of slow down uh, childhood for our uh, kids. So went out, interviewed for a job, completely different field. It was in a field called, uh, area called public affairs. And as basically development. Yep. Um, donor development. Yes, sir. Yep. And initially I thought, what is donor development? I had no idea what development or, you know, this form of fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounded like a job too good to be true. What they wanted me to do was make friends for the ministry. And I mean, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. You know, my first question was, and I asked Dr. Dobson specifically, 
so you want me to make friends with the ministry, right? He's like, yes. I'm like, how will you measure that? And he said, well, you know, we really don't have any way to measure. We just want you to make friends for the ministry. And I took him at his word. And that's exactly what I had the privilege of doing for 11 and a half years at Focus. So I had a region, the Northwest, and then they gave me Southern California since I was familiar with that. And so we had some crossover then. You know, I knew you were, but when did you come? So I started in 97, August okay. of 97. And I was there until Doc left. And, okay, I left and, and I left with Doc to go help start Family Talk. So I was good. there at Focus 12 and a half years, then another two and a half almost at Family Talk. So okay. 15 in total for Doc. Outstanding. Yeah, yeah, I knew you were there. I don't think our paths crossed while we were I there. I would see you occasionally okay. walk by when you'd have your visitors come in and you'd be showing them the broadcasting division okay. and take them into the studio, that kind of stuff. Yes. Yep, yep. So, yeah, what a privilege. I mean, in the, in the people and the experiences we it was had. So good. It, it was, was glorious. So I, mean, I mean, I don't know for you, my three mm. biggest takeaways, and I think I may have said this on the podcast before, my three biggest takeaways were, one, the mentoring and discipling by all of these godly men mm. and women. Mm. Mentoring and discipling by listening to the broadcast, every single, working on these broadcasts. Two, being surrounded by every freaking denomination under the sun. Mm. And broadcasting was set up in mm. such a way that we had margin because when the workload would expand and things would hit the fan and we'd have to make massive changes to the schedule, all that, we had the capacity to be able to do that and, and not kill ourselves. Nice. And then we'd go right back down to you know the normal workload. And it was during those margins when the workload didn't blow up that either we were being creative or we were just hanging out and talking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would sit in a conversation with someone who was a Presbyterian. I, I grew up in the AG, Assemblies okay. of God. So I grew up Pentecostal, charismatic. But I was really intrigued because in, in morning devotions, we, we'd all take turns talking about stuff or showing videos. I remember watching R.C. Sproul and being just blown away by this guy and mm. saying, wow, he's making some really good points. I don't necessarily, I've never heard anyone explain it like that. Mm -hmm. And so I would sit there and I would talk to, the, you know, Every denomination under the sun. Okay, why do you believe what you believe? Mm -hmm. Huh. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but you've challenged me to kind of dig in and try and figure this out a little bit more because I know you mm -hmm. and I love you. Mm -hmm. And we have sweat and blood and tears in these trenches mm -hmm. together working mm -hmm. for this organization, mm -hmm. doing all that. Mm -hmm. And so it really gave me an appreciation for the church as a whole, mm -hmm. the, for, for the entire body. And then the other one was just uh, once I became the chief audio engineer, Doc, Mike, I, I love the man. <laughs> Absolutely love the man. I mean, he is one special human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, being around him in the way in which I was as the chief audio engineer, I got access to him in ways that very few people at Focus did. I bet you did. Because I would fly out to Southern California. We'd record because we'd be going out to Palm Desert. We had to turn off the air conditioning because you can't have the air conditioning clicking on and off in the middle of a recording. Mm -hmm. And so we'd crank the air, turn it off, have a ceiling fan. We'd be sitting in shorts and T-shirts and surely make us lemonade. <laughs> we'd get the stuff recorded, break for lunch, turn the AC back on. Lunch and dinner with Doc and Shirley. It was just, it was awesome. That's great. Just great human beings. Absolutely. And, and, and human beings in which I tell people this. Everything you heard about them in front of the microphone they were behind the microphone. Mm. I would watch Doc stop a broadcast to get a call from Ryan or Danae or Shirley because it was, his family was the most important thing to him. Mm -hmm. Period. Wow. Yeah, to be able to work, and particularly for you, that closely for a man of that integrity, that's a rare commodity. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, I look back at it very fondly. Yep. And I as well. Yeah, my years, I think I was there 11 and a half years. And uh, very, very grateful for many of the things that you just shared and the relationships on the road and the adventures and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great section of the road. And I left shortly after Doc left as well. I, I developed a close friendship with a guy in our department who started a ministry to uh, kids in prison. Victor Marks started uh, All Things Possible. Oh, Victor. You know Victor? Oh, I love, I love that man. <laughs> He's such a good dude. Amazing story. Do you know if he likes cigars? 
Victor doesn't like cigars. I've oh, worked on him. That's a shame. But you know, we, Victor, we, if you ever listen to this, man, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the stories about Victor that I could share is uh, he's a character. He is quite a character. So Victor very graciously gave me an opportunity to come with All Things Possible at the front end. And we were traveling, ministering to kids incarcerated. And uh, these are kids in prison. It wasn't juvenile hall, it was prison. You know, as you know, kids can do everything adults can do. These were rapists and murderers and yeah. hardcore kids. And then the ministry moved to Waco, Texas. So we moved to Waco, Texas, spent eight months in Waco. And that was a ministry that was big enough for my heart. Because in Texas, being in the Bible Belt there, they, it didn't make them nervous that we were going in these prisons and sharing the gospel. Mm. And I had developed a seminar called The Authentic Journeyer that was basically kind of an integration of all things important to me that I think are just central to, to living a life worth living. Yeah. And I increasingly, that was kind of the song on my heart that I wanted to sing. And Victor liked that, so I had the opportunity to be able to share that in prison with these kids, et cetera, et cetera, and loved that. Unfortunately, we got ahead of ourselves financially. So after a year and a half with ATP, I resigned. Mm -hmm. And then we needed to decide what now? I mean, our kids were up and out. They were all in college and starting their lives. And so it was a chance if we wanted to, to move back to San Diego. But yet when we, when we kind of stopped and, and kind of assessed everything, really home at that point because we had raised our kids in Colorado Springs, actually right here in Monument is mm -hmm. where we raised our kids. Yeah. Is uh, in, in our church, we had started a home church about 18 years ago that was still going to Monument Home Church. And many of our friends were still in this area, so we decided to move back to Colorado Springs at that point. Mm. So that was in 2007. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about that chapter in our journey was very few people knew that I was a, a mental health professional. I was a schmoozer. I'm a yeah. development guy. Yeah. I'm the guy going out yeah. and gripping and grinning and befriending yeah. people for the ministry. Yeah. But what I loved about the job back to focus was that when some of our uh, uh, donors found out that I had a mental health field background. They would talk to you. Yeah. And talk to you about things they wouldn't talk to about any, to anyone else. It's true. Wow. You've heard wow. the old adage, it's lonely Doc, at the top. When, when you were hired, did Doc know that you had that background? I don't think he did. Oh my gosh. I don't think so. I am blown away. that Because yeah. I, mean, I know how much Doc loves and appreciates professionals in the mental health and, mm -hmm. and physical health. I mean, doctors, nurses, psychologists. He has a great deal of love and respect because he worked all those years at Children's Hospital sure. in Los Angeles. Yeah, of course. And, and I am really surprised that, I mean, you, you weren't his golden child because... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and to tell you the truth, I don't think we've ever had that conversation. Wow. I wouldn't be wow. surprised if he ever knew that. Wow. Yeah. So, but it was wonderful, Steve, because I got to do the best part of my job mm -hmm. as a counselor, getting to know people at deeper levels and knowing and being known by them. It was appropriate then mm -hmm. to be known by them. Really, the job at Focus after, I think at that point, before I took the job at Focus, I had been in counseling for about 13 years. It really felt like an invitation to come out and play. Really? Yeah, just to be me. Really? Fully, as opposed to in a clinical setting. Clearly and appropriately, it's all about the client. Mm -hmm. But truly, the best relationships really occur around knowing and being known. Mm -hmm. So this was that opportunity. Mm. So it was all the, the joys of getting to know somebody else and then getting to be known mm -hmm. by them without the clinical responsibilities, you know, or, you know, being concerned mm -hmm. about people's mental health and, and some of the things that go with that. So I, I'm just so thankful for that opportunity. So how was that transition back here? Did you get hired on by a... a an office here, or, or did you start building your own book of business? It's a really good question. And it was really scary, frankly, because I didn't have 
connections with other therapists. Very few people knew I was a licensed mental health professional. So at 53, it felt like starting over. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was uh, rice and beans for a while. It was pretty thin pickings. Yeah. So we actually, at that point, decided to move to Colorado Springs. We love living in Monument, and it, it was really great for our kids because we lived on some property where they could, you know, the boys could do their army thing, and it was just great to be able to, being from Southern California, to be able to, to live in the country, et cetera, et cetera. But we really wanted to be kind of closer to the city, so we, we actually moved uh, downtown, actually just north of downtown. Mm. And um, like where, what area, what uh, neighborhood? Are you familiar with the Patty Jewett yep. area? Yep. Yep. In that area, we're still there. Nice. Love that area. Yeah. Yeah. We were kind of the youngsters on the block at 53. It's kind of an older community, and we just uh, love being fairly close to downtown. It was just, one of the things when I lived kind of north of there at Union and Uinta area. Oh, yeah. On my street, there were still a few couples that had built the house in the 50s. Yes. And they had been there since the 50s when, when they built that yep, house, yep. early 50s. That's not uncommon. And it was so cool to be in this neighborhood as a young adult in my early mid 20s and uh, um, have these neighbors that, you know, it, all ages on, on my street. It was so fun. I loved it down there. Absolutely loved it. We love it as well. And we've got a number of people that fit that description on our street. Yeah. So, yeah, at 67, we're still kind of the youngsters. I just <laughs> met a woman walking. I was walking around the block. She was in her wheelchair, bless her heart, watering her rocks <laughs> in her front yard. And I found out she's a centurion. She just hit 100. So that's, that's what I mean so by awesome. where the, that's very, awesome. very cool. That's awesome. So. I want to be kicking butt when I'm triple digits. Well, I'm hopeful about the information you shared earlier. Dude, about Maybe I, we'll I, go to 120. I, I My second favorite podcast I listen to, and I think I've mentioned this a couple times on the podcast, is a podcast called Living Beyond 120. Oh. The hosts are um, an interventional cardiologist turned functional medicine doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. He lives, he's in the Dallas area. Hmm. He's in Dallas, Dallas. And then his co-host, Mark Young, who's a marketer and a uh, little bit in the health, but he's mainly in marketing. And the two of them talk about all the cutting edge stuff that's coming and all with the goal of increasing health span. When they started the podcast, they said that um, they, they wanted to make 100 the new 60. Because what's the point in living to 120 if you're feeble and infirmed and right. unable to do stuff for 20 years? Right. That, that's no life. Yeah, there's no it's, quality it's, of it's, life. It's, it's all about expanding health span. Got it. Keeping us healthier longer. I am way healthier than my parents were at 47. Way healthier yep. than my parents were at 47. And my parents, I would venture to think, were probably healthier than their parents. Although my mom's parents were pretty healthy. And the stuff that they're talking about that, that um, Gladden and Mark Young are talking about on Living Beyond 120 lately, just the stuff that's coming, we're seeing some massive breakthroughs that are happening that are, I don't want to say reversing aging, but they're definitely slowing down and rolling back the biological clock. So I subscribe to a service called Viome, V-I-O-M-E. And what they do is they, when they started, it was all about measuring your gut microbiome, hmm. figuring out what's going on and helping you to maintain a good homeostasis. Because when stuff gets out of whack, a lot of our immune system comes from the health of our gut. If our gut's healthy, the rest of us is going to be more healthy. It's not that we're going to never get sick, but if we have a really stellar gut microbiome, we're do it really helps to make things a lot better. They just added some additional stuff, a blood test that measures mitochondrial health, cellular health, all of this stuff. I took the test, the health test, what was it, three months after Elizabeth passed. And naturally, as expected, everything had fallen off a cliff. Mm. I mean, it was the first time for the mitochondrial health, cellular health, and all that. But my biological age at 46, they came back as 50. Which is understandable. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you go through that kind of a trauma, absolutely. it's going to absolutely wreck your body yep. and wreck it for a while. Yeah. I took it again in May at 47. My biological age is 40. 
Ho- so I had an 11 Biden. year swing. I had an 11 year swing. And I've, I've actually taken things up to a whole new level by seeing a functional medicine doctor, Dr. Abid Hussein up in Denver. The guy is freaking awesome. And do, working with some cutting edge stuff, some peptides and some SARMs and those kinds of things, starting to kind of play around with that to try and optimize just a little bit more. He's given me some peptides to really help, try and help heal my brain more because um, I I don't know if you know the science behind it, but when, when you go through that kind of a trauma of losing a spouse or a kid, the cortisol damages Mm -hmm. your brain actually damages Mm -hmm. your brain. And it Mm -hmm. takes a good two years at least to fully recover. Mm -hmm. And I've been taking these nasal peptides that are, that have been supposed to just try and help to slowly regain Mm -hmm. and accelerate some neuroregenesis and that kind of stuff. And, Dude, I'm, I have flashes of feeling like I did in my 20s, the, that kind of mental clarity, wow. that kind of energy. And so I'm, I'm just keeping to take things up just a bit and see with my next biome test if I'm below 40, if that I'm back in my 30s biologically. Very cool. Very, very cool. You're going to be the space monkey. You're going to be the, the first guy that runs a marathon in 120, Steve. I have no interest in running. I hate running with such a passion. I'll hike. Okay, I'll, all right. I'll, 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 I'll hike the Colorado Trail from Denver all the way to Durango, 500 miles. I'll do that at 120 before I do a, before I do a marathon. <laughs> That's very. And I'll cool. happily do that one. Yeah. So, 53, you're back. Rice and beans. <sighs> trying to build this. What was that like? Well, it was. Uh, yeah, it was very sobering. Because really? I basically, it felt like starting at ground zero because I really, I, I'd known a few uh, uh, therapists through Focus. My wife, I don't know if you know this, Steve, she's a therapist. Is she really? Yeah. Oh. Huh. And she's been at Focus, she's just uh, hit 15 years. Hmm. So she does a lot of their bilingual, Elaine is bilingual, and she does a lot of their bilingual counseling on the phone. Yeah. And so I had grown Willie Wooten and... and yeah. uh, I love Willie. Yes. He's a special dude some really neat colleagues of hers that were counselors. So I did know a few people and they knew that I was a, a licensed counselor, but really it was, it was kind of beating the bushes. It was going around introducing myself to pastors and speaking whenever and whatever I could just to get known. What year did you come back? That would have been in 2007. 2000, that's right. I think you, missed, yep. you said that, 2007. Yep. Wow. So yeah, slowly but surely, Worked my practice up to where I've been in my office now downtown for 13 years. So just very grateful. Yeah. And, and, and doing well enough that when I called you, when I texted you after Elizabeth passed, and I was like, Mark, can I meet with you? You were like, I'm sorry, man. I'm so booked. Here's three references. And I'm, uh, and, 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 and I'm, I'm sorry. And, but here's the thing. I am super glad that you introduced me to Evelyn Baudet mm. because as we were saying before, I mean, you, you gave me three names, Willie, someone else, and Evie. Okay. And uh, um, as soon as I talked to Evie, as soon as I found out that she specialized in grief counseling, and as soon as I found out that she taught mm-hmm. grief counseling at Denver Seminary, it was like, this is who we need to go see. And the boys connected with her so well. The boys would have freaking loved you too, though. They would have absolutely loved you. But mm-hmm. having someone who specializes in it, I think, was really good for I'm her. So, really good for us. So glad to hear that. Really good for us. That's wonderful. Yeah. So business as well. Business as well. Uh, as, as I said before, I'm, I'm getting to be an old guy. So one of the things I love, uh, I tell people I love my boss. I think he's very reasonable, seems to know me well, <laughs> takes good care of me. So at 65, I went from four days a week, I'm down to three. Yeah. And so, you know, I really love what I do. So kind of the game plan is bring that plane in for a landing slowly. And uh, at least what it looks like on paper, as I'm looking forward to 70, maybe to knocking them down to two. Yeah. But very grateful to be able to do what, what I'm doing now. I love it. Let me ask you something. And this was the, uh, I wanted to get your story on here, but then I also wanted to really talk about this. A lot of guys that are in Holy Smokes talk about, you know, how beneficial it is as a community. I would assume to, that you would feel being around men Men being around men, and it's not that we only have men in Holy Smokes, but Mm -hmm. I mean, it's primarily men. We don't get that enough in our lives, and Holy Smokes is a really good way to genuinely connect with other men Mm -hmm. and how important that is. Mm -hmm. 
At what point should someone consider therapy counseling for stuff that's going on internally? Because mm. I know that there are men listening right now that feel like this is good, but there's still big stuff in there that they don't know how to work with, whether mm -hmm. it's childhood trauma or mm -hmm. anger issues, porn addiction, sexual addiction, whatever, what mm -hmm. secret alcoholism, whatever. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of advice you would want to give listeners mm -hmm. to kind of say, this is the point at which you really should mm -hmm. find a counselor? Right. And how does someone find a good counselor? Because as someone who has worked with a child psychologist, worked for a child psychologist for all those years at Focus and Family Talk, there are good counselors and there are not good counselors. Mm -hmm. There are counselors that are a good fit and there are counselors that are good but are not necessarily a good fit. Right. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. And I guess I'd start by, you know, one of the things that I think that Holy Smokes offers is the opportunity to know and be known. And again, I'm, we've got women in this group too. I think that's wonderful. But for men, I know that fellowship in the basement, eating uh, donuts and drinking coffee wasn't scratching a word it's for me. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's just something about the venue of being able to be with guys and do something that we really enjoy in more of a natural venue that that lends itself to, I think, more of uh, vulnerability and authenticity. So I think it was Larry Crabb that said that, you know, if the church was doing its job more functionally and more wholly, that it would put a lot of counselors out of business. So in other words, there is a time and a place for professional counseling. And yet at the same time, if we are willing to know and be known more just in natural circles, I think a lot of those deeper needs are gonna be met. I remember a counseling professor of mine said, I don't know who discovered water, but I'm certain that it wasn't a fish, <laughs> right? I mean, we're so immersed in our own stuff yes. that we're gonna be the last people to probably see it. And so, you know, just the opportunity to be in safe settings where people are curious about our stories. I think one of the most effective ways that we can affirm someone is simply to be curious about their story. Because the meta message there is, you're interesting. You've got goodies for me. Tell me more. Uh, there's something about just that pursuing somebody that in and of itself is affirming. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm taking a long way around your no. question. No, no. But I think it takes at least two to know myself. In other words, I'll never forget, this is a hilarious story. Uh, I was annoyed initially, but I had a young man in my uh, practice who came in, he was probably 30. This is maybe four or five years ago. He sits down and, and within about five minutes, he says, well, he says, well, Dr. Humphreys, he says, I've seen something about you that you've never seen. And I'm thinking of him, I'm mean, this cocky, cocky guy. I said, what would that be? He says, your face. I said, my face? I said, I may not like it, but I gotta get up every morning. I look at this ugly mug in the mirror. I've seen pictures. He says, you know, you're making my point. I said, what's your point again? He says, you've never seen your face. All you've seen is mirror images or photographic images. And I thought, damn, he's wow. right. Wow. So it sounds like a silly point, but it's actually a very profound point. Mm. I've never experienced me. I am me. So it takes trusted brothers, please be kind. <laughs> but that's really the deepest end of therapy, mm. is trusting someone enough to know how they experience you. Mm. And so you don't need to be a trained professional to do that. We can all do that with each other. If there's mm -hmm. the safety, the curiosity, the vision for why that's even important mm -hmm. to help us live a qualitative journey going forward. And so that's something that I think is just uh, invaluable that a group like this seems to lend itself to. 
At what point does someone need to seek someone out? Professionally? Mm -hmm. Um, I would just say, you know, some of the obvious things are, you know, trauma is a killer. There's been so many studies that, well, you mentioned it earlier. It affects your brain chemistry. There are theories, and I think they're true, that, that people retain traumatic memories at a cellular level. I just shared on Facebook. They're showing that scientifically. Mm -hmm. And I really posed the question. I, I said, I've, knowing what I know about epigenetics... Mm -hmm. I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I do a ton of reading and I'm mm. fascinated with mm. science. So I read a lot about science. I read a lot about business. I read a lot about biographies. Those are like my big three that I mm -hmm. read. Science and health. And I've hypothesized for years, having friends that are new age, believing in past lives and all that. And I've really hypothesized. What if those memories that they claim to have mm -hmm. are just simply generational trauma passed down? And they're showing mm -hmm. scientifically mm -hmm. through mice that these fears can be instilled in parents and it's thus passed down to future generations. It's wild stuff. It's crazy. Mm. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. But it also lends credence to the sins of the father shall be passed on to the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's real stuff to be sure. So, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of funny. Part of my... Uh, counseling training was I was required to be a client in a counseling relationship on, in my master's program. And I'd never been in counseling before. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to be the client. And it was a woman, I'll never forget, San Diego State. I think it was five or six sessions. And about the second session, Mark, she says, I don't want to correct you, but I do need to tell you something. Because one of the things that was happening is when she was regularly pursuing me about me and my story, I would always ask her at the tail end of that, well, how about you? What about mm -hmm. you? And uh, she said, Mark, you need to know that when you do that, we're off task. This is all about you. And what she helped me discover is one of my pet peeves had been people that had always talked about themselves ad nauseum. And you didn't want to be that guy. I did not want to be that guy. I was so super sensitive to that that I would really pretty rarely, I kind of overcompensated. I'd rarely yeah. talk about myself at all. And when she gave me not only permission, but encouragement, this is about you. Man, I took that ball and run, but I tell people, man, she fixed me so good. I've been talking about myself <laughs> ever since. <laughs> but no, it really was. I'm sure you guys have probably experienced that. What a wonderful invitation when somebody is genuinely curious about your story to be able to share that. So, yeah, I, I think we can do that for each other. I to me, that's what fellowship is. Mm. We're doing church right now, gentlemen, as far as I'm concerned. Two or more are gathered, keeping it real. I'm counting it. So how does someone find, someone that's listening right now to the show, they know they've got something from their past mm. that's just holding them back. It's causing bad decisions, bad mm. um, reactions in their life, stuff that they don't want to do. How does someone find a good counselor and someone that really kind of fits for them and fits what they're looking for and what they want to get out of it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, obviously when you had called, I'd given you a few referrals, but it's hard sometimes to know because it's got to be a right fit there can be uh, really skilled counselors that for whatever reason, if a client comes into their office, there's just not that connection. So there really is kind of that dimension, that X dimension where people would connect with a counselor. But I would just say, you know, basic, um, you know, means would be, you know, talking to people you really trust, seeing who they know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what to tell you other than that, to find a trusted counselor, just, Talk to trusted people and just keep your antennas up. And, and I'm always amazed how many clients will come into my office and not me ask me anything about me. And I encourage that. Ooh. I, I Ooh, really encourage them. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. to find, I don't want to waste their time or money yeah. or energy. Yeah. If this isn't a good fit, let's find somebody who does. 
you know, kind of thing. Because I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea or I'm not going to be on the same frequency with everyone. So there's a lot of dimensionality there. But I think you start with trusted people that you know. And then I think if you're seeking it, generally you'll find, you know. If you're hungry, you just got to go after that and be persistent and, you know, ask around. Hmm. So. so, Mark, you have a seminar that you've developed called The Authentic Journeyer. What is it? The Authentic Journeyer is, and by the way, I've taken some heat for that name because people say journeyer isn't a word. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it is now. It's my seminar. <laughs> because it best says what I want to say. Life is a journey, but it takes a journeyer to do it. So the authentic journeyer is all about one's personhood. And the subtitle of the seminar is examining our lives to live and love well. I would say it's an integration of what I feel are the most vital truths in life to do that, to live and love well. Interesting fact, I think most people love the idea and the notion of being a person of integrity. I just love the word. I love the way it sounds. It's strong. Integrity. Integrity is the root word of the word integration. Mm. And the people that I've really come to trust most and that have made the most impact on my life are people that have very intentionally throughout their whole life integrated truth. All truth. All truth is God's truth. And so um, basically, the authentic journeyer is one that tries to integrate any and all truths into uh, a whole that guides their path. And so basically, the seminar is four parts. It starts with honesty. And then just to give an overview of it, it's honesty, truth-seeking, faith, and courage are the four parts of it. Mm -hmm. But it's critical that we start with honesty. And the reason that's critical is I've known a number of people in Christian circles that are strong Christians that uh, know far more biblical truth and theological things than I do. But sadly, sometimes when I'm talking with them, it feels concrete. Or it doesn't feel like it's live and fluid and moving. Mm -hmm. It feels more static. So um, basically, I think the only place to start is honesty. Because what if we apply the truth of something that's objectively true to a subjective mind and heart that's not honest about everything? Mm. So for example, I mean, I, I strongly believe that you can't have faith unless you have doubt. Those are flip sides of the same coin. Mm. So, but sadly, oftentimes we're ushered into theological systems where the inference is if you doubt your, your sinning. Defense mechanisms can be very, very uh, creative. And uh, people are unfortunately covertly encouraged to pretend or to develop an image maintenance mm. that, that is not authentically them. How and much worse has that gotten with social media? You know, I'm not a social media fan or I don't know a lot, but it has to be exponentially worse yeah. because you know, now kids, are just, it's so many virtual relationships. People know each other through all these social mediums as opposed to what we're doing. So my counseling professor was right. Yeah. E either you own it or it will own you. Yeah. But it's all coming out in the laundry. Mm. And so got to start with honesty and got to stay with honesty. Mm. So that's the start. The next uh, dimension is truth seeking. That's what it's all about. That's the hill we should all be willing to die on. The Bible says, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Jesus comes upon the Pharisees and they're got their nose in the in the text, in the Torah. And they're doing due diligence, I suppose, as best they can to understand all this truth about him. And Jesus says, here I am. I am the truth. You'll find the truth in me. So it's the truth about everything, not mm. just religious truth. You're talking about science. Yeah. 
science is true. We ought not be afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, uh, sidestep things that may give them dissonance about their faith. And at that point, they're not integrating, they're not trying to integrate dissonant information. Yeah. Well, either that will own them or they own it. I mean, what's wrong with saying, wow, this uh, information really troubles me. I don't know how to integrate that into my system or how does that jibe with Christianity? If that's true, that that's my reality, should I be dishonest about that? Should I pretend about that? Hmm. That will own me. My professor was right. In some way, shape, or form, that's going to come out in the laundry. That's a lack of integrity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the truth. We should be heat-seeking missiles for all truth. So truth-seeking is the second part. Faith. Faith is that kind of ethereal thing. And frankly, I distinguish it from the word belief. What I believe is I'm sitting in a room right now with four other guys. I believe that. I believe I'm sitting in this chair. I trust this chair. Do I believe Jesus that way? I don't think so. Really? Really. Hmm. I think that if I believe Jesus that way, my life would look very different. Interesting. I would be much less selfish. So I have faith that Jesus is who he said he was. I can't prove it. Neither can you. If it was provable, we would call that a, a knowledge. That would be like a scientific fact. By definition, faith is unprovable. That's why it's faith. So let's keep that real too. So faith, I come to that, I do the best I can with all of the capacities that God has given me to understand the truth. And I come to this place where there's this need in my heart not only for me, but as I look at the world and mankind that I, I, I forget who it is. It was a C.S. Lewis that talks about the God shaped void. And we hear this wonderful story about Christ. Who um, was the expression of his father who comes on a recon mission for us on planet Earth to show us the way that this is to be done to redeem us. But I can't prove that. I mean, his disciples walked with him and some of them bailed. So to me, faith is that desperate part of my heart that so needs that God-shaped void filled. And when I hear the story of Christ, it so deeply resonates with my heart. And it's a believable faith. It's a rational faith. He was here 2,000 years ago, 33 years, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So... I am now choosing to act like that's true. That's mm. the courageous part. Even though I don't know that's true. I doubt from times. I have dissonance. But he's my only hope. And so faith to me is acting like it's true. I was trained in a model of psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy. That's a study of how our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, and even our physiological reality are all intertwined. And they, by definition, they affect each other. We're whole integrated beings. So we're conditioned. Mm. So as we learn how those different things function, we can begin to get a better understanding. You know, the Bible says, take every thought captive for as a person thinks, so they are. So if you liken those four parts of that model, cognitions are our thoughts, emotions are feelings, behaviors are actions, physiological. And the physiological thing, unfortunately, sometimes Christians, for whatever reason, they minimize that part physiological. But as you were talking before, Steve, it's such a real dynamic. You're talking about the science of what goes on in our brain chemistry. Fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. That's a very real thing. So we understand all those things, but so we can then examine our thoughts to understand why the best lies always have a little bit of truth in them. Mm -hmm. And in, in cognitive behavioral terms, that would be called a cognitive distortion or mm -hmm. a thinking error. I've heard some people call it stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. So if the thoughts are the locomotive and the locomotive is pulling us in the wrong direction, 
Don't be surprised if you have emotional ramifications and then behavioral ramifications about that. Yeah. So I love CBT because it lines up well with the Bible in terms of take every thought captive. So the bottom line is the, the end of the authentic journey is to try to act courageously given our convictions, to keep it real, to be honest, to try to be men of faith, to try to abide and obey, which by the definition, that's how we win in Christian terms. Winning in Christian terms is simply abiding and obeying yeah. as opposed to getting the most scalps for Jesus yeah. or et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a real, that's cool. real uh, 30,000 foot overview of the authentic journey. And where do you give this seminar? Wherever I can. I love men's uh, retreats. I've gotten to do that upon occasion and, you know, three day weekend where guys just like we're doing right now, cigars and good whiskey, keeping it real talking about our owies. I'll end on this. For me, courage, I always used to think encourage is kind of a weak word. I want to encourage you. You know, I just want to encourage you to do this. I was in a, in a men's group where we had the privilege of a dozen other men where we were very intentionally there to talk about what was hamstringing us as Christians. And we very intentionally shared that. And what I loved is when I told my story about my dysfunction, some of my addictiveness, et cetera, et cetera, these guys let me tell my story. Mm -hmm. They didn't try to rescue me or anything else. They heard the whole story. And then what they said is, well, Mark, I don't doubt that's true. And that's rough. I'm sorry you're wrestling with those. Can I tell you what I see in you? And it was as though they reached in my gut bucket and they pulled out, I see honesty. I see courage. I see a good man who's really struggling. Mm. They did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Ooh. Yeah. So the root word of courage is we can do that for each other where we're reaching into each other's gut buck and saying, Steve, you know what? That may trip you up from time to time, but can I tell you what I see too? So in other words, it's not an either or. I'm not minimizing your struggles. Yeah. However, I also see a good man who's yeah. in a dog fight. And bro, I want to encourage you to continue that tenacity. It's worth the fight. Mm. That's a little bit about the authentic. All right, holy smokers. He's doing it at men's retreats and such. So if you have a ministry that's doing men's retreats, <clears throat> Rod Jones and anyone else, consider bringing Mark out as a speaker to talk about this if this has ministered to you. Mark Humphreys, let's get to rapid fire questions. Hey everyone, before we get to the rapid fire segment, I wanted to talk about a way that you as a listener can support the show and the growth of Holy Smokes by becoming a monthly supporter at patreon.com slash holy smokes. Patreon is a support platform and for as little as $5 a month, you can get bonuses like ad-free versions of these podcast episodes, Holy Smoke swag like t-shirts and more. That's patreon.com slash holy smokes. We're looking to get 40 Patreon supporters at an average of $10 a month. And once we hit that, we'll be able to pay for all the costs for hosting, editing, writing, posting. I won't be paying for that out of my pocket or through the volunteering of my own personal time. And as we grow that number to 100 and 150, 200 patrons, we'll be able to do two shows a week, hire a part-time assistant and web developer, record on location and around the world and more. I want to visit groups and get those stories from so many of you listeners that I hear from. I want to go to Seattle and I want to go to Dallas and I want to go to Charleston, South Carolina, and I want to go to Kentucky and Chicago and Phoenix, Atlanta, DC, Charlotte, back to Southern California and more. We want to help grow your groups and plant new ones for those of you in areas without active groups. So can you help us out? Become a regular supporter at patreon.com slash holy smokes. There's a link in the show notes. That's patreon.com slash holy smokes. Or if you want to make a one time tax deductible gift, go to paypal.me slash holy smokes club. That's paypal.me slash holy smokes club. And both of those links are in the show notes. Thanks. Rapid fire. Fire here. 
How's that stick treating you? Very well. Thanks again. You've done nice. the right thing Joe for me, Basil. Steve. Joe yes, Basil. Joe Basil. Doug, we're going to need some more. I've only got a few left in my humidor. <laughs> when did you first try cigars or pipe? Um, I mentioned I was with Focus on the Family. My first cigar smoking was with John Eldridge. John and I became friends at Focus. John, I love I loved that guy. I, I had a short time when he was at Focus and I was at Focus. Okay. I had great respect for him. John was a gift because John was putting into words better than I could what I always knew to be true. Mm-hmm. And so that was wonderful. And I remember we were out doing a retreat with some donors in Oregon. And after the retreat, we snuck up to the top of this building with some good single mulch and some good cigars. And, uh, geez, that's what, 27 years ago? Yeah. So, yep. Have you ever tried pipe? Not a pipe guy. Too much monkeying around. They go out too quick and stuff like that. <laughs> What's your favorite cigar? I like Padrones. What you gave me. We How's traded. that treating you? I love I, Yeah, I, I, I told you I had one last night when I was here oh, with Kay right. and Grayson yeah, yeah, yeah. and the other guys. And yeah, it's a good stick. It's a really good stick. I like them. Most expensive cigar you've ever smoked? Jeez. I'm not a hoity-toity guy. Probably these Padrones. I've got a buddy who gets them from somebody, you know, at a discount rate. So, about how much a stick are they? Do you get them for? You know, I think if you buy them, you know, from a shop, they may be like 16, 18 bucks. We get them for about half of that. Nice. So I would assume then the answer to the next question, best dollar for dollar cigar, would be these Padrones. I think so. I don't see them anymore, but I like Upman's and Hoya de Nicaragua's. Yeah. I loved uh, the first, I'd say the second cigar I really fell in love with was the H. Upman, mm. uh, 1846, I think. Okay. And uh, it was a Maduro, just, oh, it was tasty. A friend gave it to me, and I went and bought a box shortly afterwards. Nice. Having trouble finding that one now. Yeah, I don't, I don't see Upman's much anymore. Favorite liquid pairing with your smoke? So... I've got very few heroes, but one of them is a theologian named George MacDonald. And George MacDonald was C.S. Lewis's mentor. Mm. He never met C.S. Lewis because he was before him, but C.S. Lewis says of George MacDonald, if you like my stuff, give most of the credit to George. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, he calls him his master. Wow. So anyway, George MacDonald's a Scotsman. I went to Scotland. My wife and I went to Scotland on a wonderful trip four or five years ago and uh, visited his birthplace. and So I want to say I love scotch and I tried to. The truth is when I drink scotch, I get headaches. Yeah. For whatever reason. So I am on to rye whiskey. All right. I love rye whiskey. And my my favorite drink is whiskey sours with rye whiskey. That and a cigar will set you free. Best place you've ever smoked? Maybe overlooking the ocean. Heck yeah. The West Coast, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most memorable cigar experience. Wow, there's been so many of those. Just the level of fellowship. I would be hard-pressed to name one. Marvel or DC? I'm neither. I'm not a... Although, I I take that back. Whoever Iron Man, whoever Robert Downey Jr. is part of. Robert Downey. Marvel. Marvel. Yeah. That's a cool cat. I want to be Iron Man when I grow up. (laughs) Star Wars or Star Trek? Could care less. Favorite food? Oh, I like Asian food. Chinese, Thai. Dogs, cats, neither or both? So, I love cats. They taste a lot like chicken. (laughs) Sorry. Cats are useless. I love dogs. We bred golden retrievers for years. Yeah. We lost our last one and we didn't even want to redo it. So now we've got a 17 pound Shih Tzu who thinks he's a Rottweiler. He's cool. That's Ralphie. <laughs> Nickname growing up or in college? Oh. Well, at Focus, I had an assistant who called me Moose for whatever reason. <laughs> that's the only one I You're can think of. You're a big guy. That's the only one I can think of right offhand. What's one unusual fact that few people know about you? Ah, uh, 
It's a little embarrassing, but it's true about me. I'm an extremely competitive person. So it's not uncommon sometimes for me to think about, fall asleep thinking about winning a, a world championship age group handball championship. Have you ever played team handball? Completely different sport. It's a completely different sport, yeah. but I took a class in college okay. just, just to get a FIAD credit under my belt. I, I needed a few for the major that I was pursuing, sports medicine. Yeah. I fell in love with that sport. And it's an Olympic sport, isn't it? It is so good. And, yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it's one of the three sports that America has never meddled. They've never meddled in oh, team yeah, handball. Right? They've never meddled in badminton or table tennis. Those are the three. Interesting. And team handball is such an exciting sport. I challenge anyone that's listening to this show right now. Pause this. Go to YouTube. Type in team handball highlights. Watch a few highlights. It's an exciting sport that I am really surprised America has not gravitated towards because it's like it's basketball with a little bit of kind of uh, you're, you're throwing the ball into a goal. So it's got that like soccer goalie yeah. kind of thing going on. And you've got a, a perimeter around the goal that you can't go in. So you, you run in and you leap in and you throw it. And it's just it's so exciting. It's such a fun sport to watch. Every Olympics I watch, I'll try and devour as much team handball as I can because hmm. what I really, it's, it's big in Europe and especially in Germany. And, and the next time I go to Europe, I want to go back during team handball season mm -hmm. and watch a professional game because it's just, it's an amazing sport. Hmm. So favorite one to three books, not titled the Holy Bible. Oh, that's easy. Unspoken Sermons by George MacDonald. Ooh. Why? Oh, talk about integration. Talk about honesty, truth-seeking, faith, and courage. It's the epitome. It's a man that's in love with Jesus and not afraid to tell himself the truth about everything. And that his journey in terms of integrating all of that. Mm. Other two? There's a book called The River of Doubt. It's about Teddy Roosevelt after his presidency, where Teddy Roosevelt, this is a guy who when he became president, he lived large. It wasn't just about politics. He wanted to find out what it was like to have his world rocked by the heavyweight champion of the world. So he invites Jack Dempsey. I think this is true. If it wasn't Jack Dempsey, it was another guy Boxer like that. at the time, yeah. They wrap him up in a mattress and he says, go to work on me, Jack. He's that kind of guy. And so the River of Doubt is a story about him at 65 or something with all these hardcore young adventure going down the deepest, darkest, unexplored river in Brazil through the Amazon jungle. Crazy good book. It ended up killing him, sadly. You know the story. I've read three, I think. Teddy Roosevelt biographies, and I'm about to start, I believe it's Edmund Morris's trilogy. Edmund Morris has three books, and, and I just requested the final one from my library, and it just came in, and so I'm going to start devouring them. I'm fascinated with TR as, as a human being. Oh, my I gosh. Mean, I mean, such a great human being, yet his faults, mm -hmm. I mean, his faults when his wife died, mm -hmm. and the way he really abandoned his daughter, Alice. Hmm and really never was the father that she needed. Even after he remarried and brought Alice back into the home, there was a quote, Alice was a bit of a hellion as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And a reporter asked him, or someone asked Teddy, can you control Alice? And he said, I can either run this country or I can control Alice. I can't do both. He said it out loud. He did. <laughs> And, 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 and that, as hawkish as he was, as glorious for war as he was, and I know it was a cultural thing, that's something else that... But here's a guy who was shot in the chest. I love this story. Shot in the chest. Realized it wasn't a mortal wound. That it did, In the that, middle that, of a speech, right? No, before the speech. Oh, it was before, before the speech. Before the okay. speech, the, the would-be assassin went up and shot him, and it was his speech that was in his pocket rolled up that slowed the bullet down to keep it from going into his lungs. Great story. And so he looked, and he realized, oh, I'm not spitting up blood. Okay, so it's not mortal. He went up and spoke for 90 minutes. Love but, that, but, but before his team said, you really got to get down. We got to go to the hospital now. 
That's a toughness that I have not seen from any leader in this country for my entire life. I'm sorry. As good as leaders as we have had, nobody matches TR. Yeah. Agreed. Do you have a life scripture? Believe it or not, it's pretty innocuous, but it means the world to me. Colossians 2.6. As you have received him, so therefore walk ye in him. And the reason that's huge for me is because when I finally came back to Christ at the age of 25, I was a broken, desperate man. Mm. And I received him in that mode. And the challenge is, I think for all of us, how do we stay hungry spiritually for true life when we're so full with so many other goodies? Yeah. Who's been the greatest influence in your life? George McDonald. Ooh. Easy. Final three questions. What does Holy Smokes mean to you? And how has it contributed to your spiritual journey? It means a place of real fellowship. You know, being able to do, I I never met these mugs before, but we're sitting down and I already like them. There's just something about, now I know there can be jerks that smoke cigars, but I've met very few. There's something about guys that, obviously the cigars are, are, in one sense they're peripheral, but I think it's an invitation Like I said, cookies and milk don't set me free in the basement of a church. Mm. There's something about masculinity that most men, I think we'd just prefer to be smoking cigars, drinking whiskey. Mm. I'm not judging cookies and milk. I mean, they were great when I was a kid, but I prefer cigars and whiskey now. If you could have a holy smoke with any three people throughout history, living or deceased, who would they be? Can't name Jesus. George McDonald, I assume. (laughs) You got number one. Number two, I I think I might say Teddy Roosevelt. I'd like to pick his brain and heart and tease him or whatever, just cajole him. I just, yeah. And then the third, I would say, a modern day hero of mine is Jordan Peterson. Mm, I don't know if you guys know Jordan Peterson, but he's, uh, he's a hero to me. That's a courageous man who is finding faith, by the way. Yes. I, I sent him a, a book, a George McDonald book of unspoken sermons with a long letter about what I love and admire about him and an invitation to examine the claims of Christ through George McDonald. Final question. If we're to meet one year from today and I got your rye whiskey sour. Yes. And we're celebrating. Strong start. What are we celebrating? So this is where you're, I'm going to expose my uh, honesty. We're celebrating a, a national age group handball championship that I just won. Dude. <laughs> Mark Humphreys, I love you, my man. Thanks for being on the Holy Smokes podcast. Thanks for having me.